Lovely. Uh, before you start the speech, can I be heard? Yep, loud and clear. Lovely, lovely. Uh, before this speech, I guess I just want to give a few shout outs because this is the like, first finals I've been in, in a while. Uh, shout out to my teammates. Thank you to Alex for last minute replacing Khaled Desma as my second speaker. Yeah. Uh, thanks also to Matcha. Your whipping is absolutely brilliant, and I couldn't have gotten here without you. Uh, thank you to everyone in contingent, especially my debate kids. Stan, all of you. I hope to God that you'll get to finals like this someday. Uh, very pog. Uh, thank you also to all my coaches in ASHS and in other places. Uh, again, could have, couldn't have done this without you because y'all are very, very smart. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Uh, yeah. Starting the speech in five, four, three, two, and one. Societal narratives enslave us to the whims of society. On government, we believe that if we are to be a slave to some notion of what society wants, we should be a slave to the self and we should identify the self as much as possible. What's the context that we're going to deal with within this debate? I think that this narrative has to exist fundamentally on an extreme trade-off. So this has to be a trade-off of a pursuit of personal happiness versus a pursuit of other individuals' happiness, necessarily meaning that they have to defend a world where your own personal happiness is sacrificed, i.e. the removal of personal goals and happiness to uplift that of others. Take note, this debate necessarily isn't about donations from the upper classes. Insofar as one, donations often come from selfish interests, i.e. you want to validate your perceptions of yourself as being a good person. And secondly, because most donations aren't even large enough to destroy your finances and destroy your own happiness. To begin with, they have to talk about the most extreme cases where you have to destroy your own happiness then, what's the argumentation we're going to deal with with this debate? Firstly, on the principled obligations that you have to yourself and why that is larger to that of the responsibility to others. And secondly, on the pragmatic impacts that this motion necessarily has, especially to the most vulnerable. The framing for this first argument is simple. I think that regardless of whatever the world's social norms are, you will probably have the largest duty to the self in all instances with in things such as vacuum. So for example, just because there might be a world that dictates you should sacrifice your lungs for others, no matter what, because that's a net neutral good, doesn't mean it's necessarily morally good for that norm to exist or for those people to be coerced in that way. In that same way, we think that this motion shouldn't stand on their side of the house. What are the reasons I'm going to give for you here? Firstly, on how we generally construct responsibility to individuals and how that applies to the individual self. So we don't think that individuals have natural responsibilities to each other. Generally, they're societally constructed. So for example, I don't have any natural relation to this random guy on the street. Instead, they're determined by these social factors that connect each and every one of us. There are a few ways then that we construct these responsibilities and generally why that benefits our side more. Firstly, I think that you often have to construct how you benefit others in determinants to how much you know their preferences. That is the same. Okay, that you're only able to fulfill a utilitarian metric of knowing what is the highest value action that you can do only if you have information. So for example, if you had the choice to give yourself a cupcake and give a random stranger on the street a cupcake, and you know for certain that you want a cupcake a lot, you'll probably have a moral responsibility to give that to the self because of the fact that utilitarianism is constructed only insofar as you give value to an object, and that object can only be valued insofar as you know you value that object. So on our side of the house, we're better able to assure that the duty is fulfilled insofar as we have relevant information as to what the self wants. On their side of the house, you often do not have total information to the many whims and like parts of consciousness that people have that might determine whether or not they want something generally. So the illustration for this is simple. If you're being asked to stay up late and go through exhaustion to like listen to someone rant about some random thing that happened to them, you have more responsibility to yourself because you never really know how much they might need that rant and you know that this will come at the expense of your own happiness you don't know if that same thing applies to them and it might just be something that doesn't matter in the end and as a result 
in terms of utilitarian metric where people are better able to fulfill that and be able to fulfill their responsibility towards creating net neutral good, we think that's only on our side where they have complete information. On the comparative, they have to defend people not knowing how much it really matters and as a result that feeling. The second thing to talk about is the fact that you often interact with yourself more and are more vulnerable to the self. So within status quo, we have legal measurements to say that you have more responsibility to give money to our own kids than a random stranger on the street, given the fact that we have like, factually responsibilities to not do child neglect. Like, the same thing doesn't exist for just random strangers. So that's because on average, we interact with, our, with other individuals around us and within our family more. We have more social ties to them because the fact that we're more, or like they're more dependent on us than any other individuals, and they can, on average, turn to other people for social recourse. Why then do we fulfill this more on our side? For C, I think that we interact with more with ourselves and any other individual. So that means and manifests in the fact that I can talk to my own conscious. I have to interact with the self to be able to have a self in the first space. And necessarily, I know myself the best. As a result, I have a social responsibility towards caring for the self more. Any social norm that impedes on that and doesn't need to care for other individuals is unjust. There's something to say as that we're on average more vulnerable to ourselves than any other individual. So necessarily, we're the person who has the most capacity to be self-destructed to the self. So if I tell my friend in the early example, I can't listen to your rant. They have alternatives like other friends who happiness, whose happiness might not come at the expense of their own happiness. But if I listen to their rant with the full knowledge that I am sacrificing my own happiness to listen to it, and if I necessarily know that I'm going to feel unhappy after that. I have no recourse because I'm forced to listen to them and I'm forced to sacrifice my own unhappiness because of this norm. On their side of the house, they have to undeal with this unjust social norm. That's fundamentally horrible given the fact that we have more of a responsibility towards ourselves naturally. And we think that's fundamentally good for our side where we tell people to justify the self and only care about the self more. And we think that society has a net responsibility towards caring for those social norms more and to construct itself in a way that like prioritizes the self over others given all that analysis. The something that I'm going to say is on the capability of opposition to be very oppressive towards individual minority groups and why we're better for that. The framing of this is simple. Social norms are created as a tool to regulate social behavior. So generally people interpret social norms as a way to peacefully coexist within society. And historically, social norms have been used to regu regulate society in a way that grants power to specific groups more than others. So for example, social norms that are tied to gender tend to advantage individual men more than individual women or individuals within the LGBTQ. Because of the origin of this creation, then many social norms are unevenly applied to a variety of minority groups within society. For example, the burden to be kind is one that is pressured more onto women than men. And we think this necessarily has to exist most for the social norms that tell you to do something for other individuals, i.e. their side. What happens on their side? Firstly, I think that this allows for the continued oppression for more minority groups. It's infinitely easier for the social norm to be applied to groups in a way that holds them responsible for their own well-being or like that of the most privileged members of society. So for example, on their side, you'll have more women being tasked to shelter men from their own personal responsibilities of things such as their mental health, of these things at the point in time that they're told to sacrifice their own personal responsibilities and their own personal happiness and on the comparative. The reason then why we're better for this is simple. On our side, we have a more assertive narrative, one that tells you to stand up for yourself and for your own self-interest. As minority groups, this is also applied to us, at least marginally, and we think that is better than on the comparative where they have to deal with this more often for all those reasons and more. Ever empowered to propose. Thank you. Here, here. Thank you very much, the Prime Minister, for the speech. Um, to start the case for the opposition bench, I want to invite the leader of the opposition. Here, here. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, let me get my title real quick. All right. All right, cool. Uh, I'll be starting my speech in three, two, one. Equality to the privilege is nothing but oppression. We are proud to oppose. 
So before I move on to my substantives, what are all, what are opposition's burdens? Firstly, the moral justification as to why we ought to put other people in front of ourselves. Secondly, why you know this provides some sort of net benefit to us in both like emotionally speaking. And thirdly, why even if you feel dissatisfied from doing all this kind of charity work, you'll still get benefit by doing good with the principle of karma that will be expanded upon by my second speaker. So what are a couple of rebuttals I have for leader of opposition? Like firstly, what the leader of opposition brought up. He talked up about how you don't necessarily know what people want and you know yourself best right, because you have no what utility you want. So understand that this is not necessarily true. There's a difference from what you know people want and like what people need. If you know that, for example, if you know that someone who's facing severe bu bullying, what do you think that person wants? That person obviously wants, you know, someone to stand up for them because that person may be too shy or that person's facing too much discrimination. And therefore, you know, you ought to help that certain individual. And furthermore, on the concept of knowing yourself best, I don't necessarily think this is particularly true as, you know, humans are particularly complex beings. All of us don't necessarily know, not necessarily know what we actually want. So. Next, also like on my couple of rebuttals as well, I kind of integrate into it, integrated it into my characterizations and you know arguments because a lot of it contended with one another. Because like understand in today's status quo, they already exist both of these narratives. This debate is about those two extreme cases, whether you know we want to forfeit all personal happiness or over you know personal happiness of everyone else. So the only way to win this debate is on both sides and show why the narratives implemented by other sides cause more harm and all less benefit. So firstly, what does responsibility of our own happiness looks like? PM failed to characterize what this actually looks like. It looks like not caring about anyone else. If he's saying, screw everyone who doesn't help with my self-interest and I ought to put myself first and I'm willing to sacrifice anyone to achieve that. This looks like men, for example, joining anti-feminist movements or white people shaming the BLM movement because they want to protect their privileges. This looks like harassing people on the internet and trolling, for example, because and bullying other people because it provides some sort of happiness towards you. Secondly, is responsibility of helping other of like helping other people's happiness. It looks like maximizing happiness of everyone all around. This looks like small things like giving away for people in line or helping people in charities and whatnot, or big things like joining social movements like BLM as a white person, for example. Thirdly, what does happiness look like? It looks like as a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction, i.e. people who are disadvantaged are unable to get out and being helped by other people. Basically treating people the same way you want to be treated, being able to wake up, knowing the amount of, you, knowing the amount of good that you did in the world makes it a brighter place. So. What are my arguments to today's debate? First argument, how being more considerate overall actually provides a better, you know, net happiness among the world. That why, and this why this beats PM's contention on why we end up providing more happiness overall. So first premise, our goal is to maximize the amount of happiness in the world. That includes not only just helping out the majority of people, but everyone overall. This looks like Joe Biden advocating for black Black rights, Hank Green and Bernie Sanders, who are politicians despite being white males, be huge supporters for black rights and the LGBTQ movement and for feminism overall. And second premise, when more people are good and treated well, they more often than not do good back by the principle of karma, but that's what my second speaker is going to bring up. So understand that in today's status quo, everyone rolls the dice and plays the game called birth lottery before they are born. No one gets to decide what person of color, class, gender, etc. they are. And this is able to take down PM's argument on minority oppression. Understand our last premise here is that we have an equal chance of you know becoming a poor minority and a rich white male. Therefore, a poor yeah, we got chance of becoming a poor minority or a rich white male. Therefore, if we land as you know a rich white male, for example, we ought to help those unfortunately born less fortunate than us by you know, for example, donating cash in charities, funding welfare programs, and paying for college tuition for minorities, etc. Et and we given the op yeah. If being bullied provides my bully with a sense of happiness, do I have an obligation to allow myself to continue being bullied? Understand that that okay, I'll answer that later in my like arguments like, on, on two effects, but like okay. so understand first effect from this argument. When we help these kinds of individuals, these people are not necessarily harmed. Whereas on propositions world, you are straight up siding with right radicals who aim to increase their privilege or when rich people stand up exploiting poor minorities to increase their wealth and screwing them over and stuff like, you know, helping them, thus increasing the gauge that our capitalistic society has. 
Secondly, on our paradigm, we are aiming to abolish and restore a sense of equality in today's status quo. And this looks like a white man, you know, being colorblind to race. This also helps with discourse about race being nicer and better and more people are willing to be less ignorant as they start to be more concerned about people outside of them. Looks like voting for politicians or very secular who implement policies that help people like immigrants despite being a citizen of their country yourself. This also, sorry. <coughs> This also looks like not bullying people and making fun of them if you want to talk about small scale. Because proposition stands as usually saying, I don't care about others or not only about me and seeing you suffer brings me joy. So significance, we ought to treat others how we want to be treated. And we also, you know, shouldn't like treat people badly or harass them or even stand idly by and watch them suffer in order to protect our privilege. Because that infringes on our, <coughs> sorry, because that infringes on because that infringes on that person's right to freedom and autonomy. Because at the worst case, when you approve of this bullying happen, you're actively harming these individuals. Also, POI. on like response to the POI, sorry, I, sorry, on response to the POI, if my bully gains happiness from bullying me, the problem is he also owes me happiness. In this instance, he isn't fulfilling his responsibility, so it's a false comparison. So, like the start premise, what like that warm fuzzy feeling inside. Understand that humans see fulfillment in life. Looks like doing charity work, helping others in need, etc. Why? Because that's what a fulfilling looks like. A fulfilling life looks like based on my characterization. Someone you know who can die on the deathbed and say that I've done a lot of good in the world, inspiring others to help each other. This also looks like my debate coaches like Shireen and Ian, literally staying up till like 12 a.m. every night, edging debates and making sure I don't say stupid stuff for my opening lines and scolding me for thinking that race-based politics meant Usain Bolt running for president. Individuals like Shireen and Ian are more often than not happy as it provides emotional benefit, something that's real and not materialistic and selfish, unlike propositions for propositions world is literally I will get all the materialistic needs I want I can be selfish I can be rude and I can cause as much chaos as one because it provides me some sort of like happy selfish benefit at first but the moment you step on the dead bath you write that bath you start to realize that all these kind of things are empty you have no kind of legacy towards the end of your life and forever you'll be known as like you're nothing productive or material substantial came out from your life whereas compared to our world where you've been given that and with that I end my speech by saying do unto others as what you want others to do on to you. With that, I end my speech. Here, here. Am I audible? Uh, yeah, you're audible. All right, nice, nice, nice. Um, before I begin, um, yeah, thanks for all, thanks all for that, for you know, this wonderful tournament. Everyone has been really competitive. I really like tuning and I really like attending your really competitive, competitive debaters. But yeah, I'll be starting my speech. Right, one, two, three. Sorry, government has been running this very negative case. They talk to you about the, the harms of being, you know, of being a whim for society, but it's very strategic for them to do so because the moment that they engage with you on their case, on their case, on their side of the house, where people literally pollute the ocean for profit in pursuit of their own type of happiness, they lose this entire debate. Whole first government's argument, they become a slave to society. Now, Absolutely not. Understand that this narrative is one that's applied to everyone, right? It's not only applied to the poor people or the marginalized, but also the corporations, right? This means that you care for others and others care for you. It's not one that forces you to cater to the will of society without any sort of reciprocation. Side government isn't debating the motion in its entirety because where everyone cares for everyone, it's preferable for all. It's not you caring for society only, right? Second argument, the cupcakes and utility can't be understood by everyone else but you. False. I like how they use cupcakes when it's beyond shit like cupcakes, right? They kept talking about giving your saving to a stranger rather than to your own child, but I understand that your own child is already another part of society, right? You have to care about your own child because that is what social norms exist. What's happening under your side of the house in the extreme that you want to debate is that you squander your life saving, your life savings for gambling and drug addiction and leave your child in a cycle of poverty because that's legit your extreme case, right? What happens under yours is that monopolies and Jeff Bezos screws over the environment and everyone else and the employees because the main pursuit of their happiness is one that's a profit, right? You can't cater to everyone, no, you and but you can cater to the most number of people, and that includes your children, your families, and your friends as well. Under your side of the house, you cater to no one but the black pursuit of money at the expense of the environment, at the expense of your employees. 
Third argument, let's say the social norms are part of the ruling class. Okay, if they say the society is biased towards the marginalized, yeah. then their side is going to be far worse. The moment that a lot of people are going to trample over and discriminate against in, in, in minorities for their own pursuit of happiness, and the hours of the house, minorities can be galvanized for social change easier since people like Bernie Sanders or AOC, part of the part of the, you know, the, the you know, part of the rich, by the way, care about them. So they're more likely to achieve structural changes that are so much more needed for happiness. You know, of the house is a world in which people are indifferent to the suffering of others. You say the minorities don't need help and that they can do it themselves, but how structural barriers and social stigma exist under the status quo because if minorities can do it on their own, activism would have been a lot more successful. If you say that capitalism forces you to be competitive against other people, being individualistic yeah. worsens the dynamic because now it's going to be even more cut short. It's going to be because out because people don't care for one another anymore. I was allows people to collectivize positively against that pressure of competitiveness. But now I'm moving on to my argument. By helping others, you help yourself in the long run. And why the experience of is good. No, understand that, as a, that understand that a problem that exists right now under the status quo is that people are selfish. And oftentimes they put their pursuit of happiness at the expense of others and at worst screws over other people. Such people exist on both paradigms and are the ones that screws over the happiness or even the wealth of, of society in general. People that don't really care about the misery of other people if they can get promoted. This is that people lie and manipulate potential rivals to get promoted to a higher corporate position. Not wearing masks whenever you go outside because you feel liberated not wearing a mask or whatever that blind pursuit of happiness means to you, right? This means that that blind pursuit of happiness is the threat to society at the point of time because selfish people are going to exist nonetheless. The, com the comparative here is that at the point in time where such people are shunned and shamed for their selfish and individ individualistic action, there's the deterrent factor here, right? But yeah. Uh, will the act of kindness be conditional or unconditional in your world? Of course it's going to... No, listen, this is, this is what we mean by recipro reciprocation, right? The moment that you help other people, other people are going to help you. This is what that social norms imply. This is why we say that when you help others, others are more likely to help you as a result. And we're moving on to that exactly right now. Government is going to say that people are going to exploit the altruism of other people, right? But like, 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 not a lot of people are that malicious and evil to begin with. But let's say that's truly the case, right? People are more likely to feel empathy or guilty now because you're going against the social norm that imposed upon by society, right? The problem here is that it's symmetrical on both sides of the house. Under death, exploitative and manipulative behaviors are going to exist by virtue of their having the narrative that your happiness trumps triumphs over all and through all means necessary. This means that exploitation and manipulative behaviors are going to be even more amplified under your side of the house because that sense of guilt doesn't exist anymore. This means that if Jeff Bezos puts his entire wealth before labor rights, before his work, uh, before his employees, under our side of the house, people are more likely to scrutinize and cancel people that are like Jeff Bezos because the social norm that exists is one that gives people the incentive to call out selfish and exploitative individuals and to shun them socially, right? Under such opposition, when you have emotional connection with other people, and this one be moving on to my argument, that you help uh, that you help other people, you're more likely to have this sort of help and have happiness being reciprocated to you as well. By virtue of you having much more friends, they care for you because you once care for them, right? This is that material benefits that helping you move furniture or to teach you a certain subject you're struggling at. Or just like emotional validation and acknowledgement, right? Where you're constantly being praised by the people around you or having an altru altruism be recognized in the long term. This means that by virtue of the principles of reciprocation, our side allows not just for individual happiness through emotional acknowledgement and material help, but also help people that are victims of their circumstances like bullying or poverty or whatever. The narrative that side government support is one that is bad in particular for minorities and disenfranchised, disenfranchised communities far worse, right? Because it is the rich and the privileged that have the leverage and power in almost all aspects of life. This means that they can use everything at their disposal to pursue their own twisted views of happiness, sometimes screwing over minority community community, right? This also creates like a very tense and hostile environment because the moment that selfish people exist and are willing to do whatever it takes for their for their happiness, society as whole is pitted against one another because the moment that you said that individuals should be responsible for their own happiness first is also the moment where people are free from their civic responsibilities of holding up, of upholding social stability and harmony. This was the holding toilet papers and other essentials during the pandemic. This was the manipulating other people for your sort of um, benefits, screwing over minority community because that sense of guilt is no longer exists. You're less like 
likely to relate or empathize with people that are disadvantaged. This are, that are like disadvantaged because when your happiness comes first, it's more likely than not that you're not willing to cater to or to understand the suffering of other people because it affects your happiness. The comparative here is that when the social norm is applied to everyone, everyone including the rich and the privileged have an incentive to not screw over entire minority community because that social norm implies that when you are selfish and individualistic, you're more likely to get caught out and be hated upon by everyone. That's a big factor against selfish and exploitative behaviors that doesn't exist on the side, um, the underside government, right? So for all of these reasons above, please set aside opposition. Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much to the government for that fine speech. And now to conclude all substantive, speech, substantive speeches in its round, I invite the honorable opposition but here. here. Hi, I'm not on the ball. Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, I'll be starting in three, two, one. So government presents us two worlds, right? One world in which they say is our best case and the other world in which they say it's realistic and social norms are not the be all and all. So I'll just tackle that best case characterization first. In Gus Owens' first speaker, they fiatted that they wanted to argue the most extreme case. They wanted to argue the case in which everyone in their society follows their follows their metric or their social norm of prioritizing their own happiness over others. And everyone in our society prioritizes the metric of prioritizing others' happiness over themselves. So I don't really see how Whit can come and tell us about a quote unquote realistic world when this completely contradicts the whole case they've been running down the bench, right? And if they want to talk about the best case, uh, they say that if everyone recipro re reciprocates on our world, in a world where nobody prioritizes their personal happiness, nobody is going to be happy. I'm going to tell you why this is untrue later, but first, rebuttals. Okay, A, they say uh, people like Jeff Bezos will serve the people in the end because it will make them profit and make him happy by performing altruistic acts. They say that it will also benefit the individual individual as well. But however, the problem with this is that A, this means that Jeff Bezos lives in a society that actively praises him for caring about others, right? Which means that all the benefits we talk about of Jeff Bezos wanting to give employees raises is actually a reflection of the narrative on our side because it looks like you feeling good when you're donating to charity means that you value the altruistic, altruistic relationship and you prioritize the others' needs be be, you prioritize others' happiness or others' needs before yours because of that need being fulfilled, you yourself feel happy as well. Second, Jeff Bezos is kind of extreme. Like in most other cases, right, when your individual happiness is often not tied to wanting to help others, like what God would rather argue, if it fails, it, for example, if I am a horrible person and I don't gain happiness for wanting to spread awareness about social issues or I don't gain happiness for donating to the beggar on the street, I of course won't do, the, won't, won't do this under Gus paradigm. And no change will be no change will be enacted. And next rebuttal is on the obligation to stay oppressed because somehow the oppressed see the need to make their oppressor happy. You know, right? The problem with this is A, no, the obligation goes both ways, right? My oppressor also owes me happiness. My oppressor has an obligation to want to make me happy if I allow their wishes of oppressing me. So that is the point in time where the oppressed has the right to fight back and demand from the oppressor what they actually want by virtue of this social, by virtue of this metric, right? Second, we say even, even then, even if you ignore that, the same thing is going to happen on your bed or even worse, right? Because oppressors who are happy with oppressing minorities completely don't care about the minority's will, whereas on ours, they might even listen to them because of the influence of this social rhetoric. So at best, it's symmetrical for their side and the harms happen anyway. Rebuttal to DPM social structures. We say that gov cannot really call our benefits just by saying they can. They need to prove to you, A, how individual activism can give you the same sort of impact of collectivism on opposite on opposition, B, you need to remember when some individual actors on GAF are motivated by factors like religion or the feedback or validation that they characterize, majority of other individual actors don't care about any of these factors and they stay true to government's base principle of prioritizing themselves. On our side, when we say everybody follow their principle and give aid to everybody as well, that doesn't matter, right? No. Next, 
they say, uh, they say on, in PM, they say that you don't know what other people actually want or actually need. I think this argument is a wash because A, you yourself already don't know what you actually want and yourself actually need in life as well. Humans aren't 100% rational. They don't understand themselves 100%. Oftentimes, people do things like seeking short-term happiness over their long-term happiness through procrastination, through frivolous spending, through drug use, or et cetera, et cetera, harmful activities. On our side, we say though, it's much easier for us to know what other people want or need, right? When the social yeah. narrative is to help others, people are more likely to know, to speak out honestly about optic one and five, honestly about the kinds of aid that they need from others, especially when there's discourse, it's more accurate when multiple people put their heads together to try and determine what the other individual actually needs so they can fulfill that social norm. Instead of only caring about yourselves, therefore not wanting to listen to the problems or the, or the opinions of other people and what they feel that they need, and compare that to what you think you need, right? Okay, next. They say that benefiting others means you have to com completely sacrificing yourself. This is not true. The comparative of opposition is not that corporations are immune to the social narrative of by benefiting others, you have to give away everything you need, right? It simply means that people are more likely to want to care, over, uh, care about others marginally more. At best, right, this looks like in corporations, they want to care about their workers rather than blindly prioritize the profit. This looks like this looks like more benefits. This looks like higher wages. This looks like right. less overtime and the allowance of workers' unions on our side, right? That never happens to your side because your corporation don't give a shit. Next, we say that gov on our side we protect the most vulnerable because they are not expected to help others in their already diminished state. Okay, I'll take you. Racism exists because white people believe it's benevolent. Rich people believe wealth is best allocated if given to them. You can't make your model a magic bullet to solve all of these since they exist either way. How do you think norms will operate in a society where these are more prominent on your side in comparison to ours where you can access activism? I think it's very egregious for you to say that rich people think that wealth should only belong to them. Therefore, the poor people, the poor people will be happy when they are poor. That is a consequence of you prioritizing your own happiness. Obviously, the rich likes wealth, therefore, they can posit, according to your own characterization, that the poor likes wealth while taking it and keeping it for themselves makes maximizes their own happiness. That is according to your own characterization, by the way. So that's exactly what happens in your house and doesn't happen here. The problem with the argument that they say they could that when Gao says they protect the most vulnerable, is that there's a gap between the quality of life of marginalized communities and the privileged majority. B, it's very hard to close that gap when resources in status quo and in the past, example, access to job opportunities or education have not been as available to those marginalized communities due to factors like poverty or social stigma, right? C, it's much harder to succeed when a marginalized community is not just not just doesn't have access to those resources, they are also actively put down by the majority communities in the majority's conquest of self-happiness, right? The comparative on our side is that people don't need to benefit others to the same extent of value as others have benefited that. Then what this means that while people feel the obligation to benefit others as well repay those who benefited them, they don't need to sacrifice themselves completely to repay. Your exact metric is that complete self-sacrifice is not exactly what the other person wants. You don't, yeah. Rather, you posit that individuals who want to repay others by measuring their capability to according to what other people want by asking for their opinions, right? Even in our work case, work case where people choose to help others at the expense of themselves, that's still okay because on our side, we care of society where it's likely that someone else will be there to help them back because of these reasons for people's. Here, here. Thank you very much to the uh, opposition who went for the fine speech. And that concludes all substantive, substantive speeches in this round. Um, now for the reply speeches, I first invite the opposition reply. Here, here. Um, hi, this is Lord Sun Around. Uh, am I audible? Like, is this my dominant voice? Am I audible? Yeah, it's fine. All right, nice, nice. Okay, uh, okay, okay. Okay, um, okay I'll be starting. My speech in three, two, one. It's quite unfortunate that side government never addressed our characterization, debated only on the idea that you have to cater to society, but never vice versa, impose burdens upon us that they never solve themselves, and want us to debate the extreme without even acknowledging the extreme under their side of the house, in which selfish people screws over tens upon thousands of people for their blind pursuit of happiness, be it profit, be it superiority, be it ego, to which they interpret as happiness, right? This looks like corporations that are more likely to hike up prices and to exploit the 
desperation of poor people in order to get more money. This is like that Jeff Bezos screwing over the environment, screwing over the employees simply because he wants money. Or you bullying other people simply because your two cents of happiness is what matters the most, right? I seriously don't know why side government should win this entire debate. Five reasons as to why we win. First, they never try to engage with the debate at all, right? Social norms are social norms for a reason. This means that everyone is able to cater for everyone else, but let's say that it's not, right? That social norms is the product of the ruling class of the privileged. The dynamics is going to be far worse the moment that you have the rich and the privileged that is able to use the, the financial and political position as a result of the birth lottery to screw over minority. The harm that was given by the whip is just a shot in the foot because they never try to engage with the extreme counterfactual that is on the their side of the house. That has nothing for Masa was rebutted by the whip. She brushed off everything by saying the no's are applied unevenly and that's it. No response to me or Ryan's argument. Second, Ryan and I already told you that by principles of reciprocation, you're more likely to gain happiness in the long run when you have friends and families that you previously helped on, on your own. Um, previously helped in the past, right? On your side of the house, no response to that whatsoever. Everything that I heard from yours was just that, oh, individuals are rational people that care for themselves, that understand their own sense of happiness when this is not true, but I'll engage with that later on. Third, they never engage with our principles of reciproc reciproc reciprocity. If, would you stay in a relationship, toxic relationship, if it makes the guy happy, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, the problem is still there, basically. It still doesn't engage in the idea of reciprocity. He also owes you happiness. If he doesn't fulfill it, you can leave. The same logic is applied to the POI of like, would you stay with your oppressed? With your oppressed? Would you stay oppressed if your oppressor is happy oppressing you? They never engage on the idea of collectivism or the idea of how it's better, how it's better able to fight capitalist pressure as a group rather than fending it off as your own by virtue of you being a minority. Third, fifth, we rebutted everything that they say, right? They say that you become subservient or a slave to society. We responded by saying that it's not true simply because society is going to care about you as well by virtue of the principle of reciprocity. They say that individuals are rational and they know what sense of what happiness means to them. We said that no, people are short-minded, people care about the short-term benefits more than the long term. This is a holding toilet papers during the pandemic, squandering your life savings away by gambling it away rather than giving it to the charity or giving it to your children. Continuously using your position of power to abuse or exploit the labors of your worker because they reaffirm your twisted sense of superiority. They say that norms are part of the ruling class. We said that it's not. People like AOC or Bernie Sanders, despite being wealthy and well off, being part of this so quote unquote ruling class, advocated for policies that serve the working class. This means that for all of those reasons above, I've never been proud to try to, to oppose the motion today. By virtue of us not only proving the fact that reciprocity exists on on ours out of the house, that we have a deterrence factors against selfish and greedy individuals that use whatever they have at their disposal to screw over everyone else, we say that there's a deterrence factor against us. Because we say the social norms are known for a reason, right? They apply more or less evenly across society. That doesn't happen under their side of the house because their extreme counterfactual is that everyone cares for their own happiness. This means that, yes, yeah, sure, minorities can advocate for their right, but what's worse is that CEOs of people that are in position of power are going to use their wealth to demonize and discriminate against them far more to combat against their source of happiness, which is contradictory to what side opposition side government says. Those of all those reasons about peace side your side opposition. Here, here. Thank you very much to the um, opposition reply for that speech. And now um, to conclude this round as a whole, I invite the gov reply. Here, here. Thank you so much. Um, am I heard?